A AAA game developer causes controversy by revealing an outrageous exclusivity deal. I wish we lived in a time when we couldn't recycle this headline throughout the year. Hey folks, this is Riker with a gaming news wrap up video where we discuss the happenings of the week. This week's topics include why gamers are canceling their Call of Duty pre-orders, some surprising Borderlands 3 sales statistics, some exciting RPG news, and more. As always, discussion timestamps can be found in the video description below, but right before we jump ahead, just a quick reminder to ring that sub notification bell to be alerted of new Saturday episodes and keep up to date with major gaming news. Now before we move on, just a quick word from this video's sponsor, Skillshare, whom we've spoken about before. I highly value education, including self-learning. That's why so much of my YouTube content is educational. I believe in sharing knowledge, and that's what Skillshare is all about. It's an online learning community with over 25,000 classes on all kinds of different topics. For instance, if you want to get into making video games, Skillshare has classes on game design, programming, and game development. And you gain unlimited access to all these classes with a premium Skillshare membership. An annual subscription to Skillshare costs less than $10 per month. And if you click the link in the video description below, you can get two free months of Skillshare. In our first story, the major controversy of the week, it has been revealed that in the upcoming Call of Duty game, there will be a game mode that will be exclusive to the PlayStation 4 for one year year. Call of Duty Modern Warfare will release on October 25th on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. However, the Special Ops Survival Mode will be exclusive to the PS4 until October 1st, 2020. And suffice it to say, gamers aren't happy. And it makes me wonder, would I be more or less upset if I couldn't play the game at all for a year? I mean, not that I'd be buying Call of Duty anyway, but let's say a game that I was looking forward to. Would I be more upset that I could only play some of the game for a year, or would I be more upset if I couldn't play the game at all for a year? And I'm almost leaning more towards that I would be more upset that I can play some of the game, but not all of the game. And my reasoning here is that, well, as long as I don't have the game, I can sort of put it out of my mind and start thinking about it again when it actually releases. Whereas if I have the game, then I'm just constantly being reminded, oh, well, there's a chunk of it that I can't play. But I turn the question to you folks, what would upset you more? Personally, I think the worst part of this is that they basically release a new Call of Duty game every year, so this mode will be exclusive up until the release of the next Call of Duty game. So if we do what Activision wants and just buy the new Call of Duty game every year and stop playing the old ones, then really what's being said is, this mode is simply not coming to PC and Xbox One. Now, this isn't even the only Call of Duty controversy to emerge this week. It's also been discovered that promotional artwork for Call of Duty Modern Warfare has been allegedly illegally using someone else's work. On Instagram here, we can clearly see the original military photo, and the creator of the piece is calling out the illegal use of his work. Now, it's highly unlikely that either Activision or Infinity Ward did this deliberately. What likely happened is that they contracted some work to a third party, and it's the third party that stole this image. Still, this is not a good look for Activision. And as if that weren't enough, there's yet more controversy. YouTuber The Gaming Revolution, who has had legitimate leaks in the past, has leaked that apparently in the upcoming game, supply drops will have weapons and not just cosmetics. The supply drops are the loot boxes of Call of Duty, but The Gaming Revolution was able to report some good news that in light of all the controversy and gamers canceling their pre-orders in droves, an internal meeting was held at the company and they're potentially rethinking that stance on their loot boxes. Now, if this leak is true, if there was enough of an upset that it has caused a meeting rethinking strategy, that means that a lot of people are canceling their pre-orders, which wouldn't be necessary if they hadn't pre-ordered in the first place. I've said it before and I'll say it again, don't pre-order games. In my opinion, the only condition under which you should pre-order a game is if you would buy that game regardless of anything that there's no headline at all that would change your mind that you would still buy that game regardless. And even then I would say don't pre-order just because it's not a consumer friendly practice. But I understand that 
we want those pre-order bonuses, I get it. I still think it's underhanded that devs basically bribe us into pre-purchasing their games, but this is where we are. Speaking of controversial exclusives, 2K has revealed some sales statistics for Borderlands 3. They reported these in a rather nebulous way, opting often to not give exact figures, but more relative figures. So for instance, they stated that within its first five days of launch, 50% more consumers purchased Borderlands 3 versus Borderlands 2, making the title the fastest selling game in 2K's history. They also stated that Borderlands 3 is the highest selling title for 2K on PC in a five day window. They also stated that across all platforms, Borderlands 3 has sold more than 5 million units within its first five days. They said that more than 70% of their sales were digital and that quote, PC sales of the title through the Epic Games Store have been incredibly strong. Now overall, this is a little suspect. I don't believe there's any disinformation going out there. I do believe that this game has sold very well and better than the previous Borderlands games and that every claim that they've made is correct. It is, however, unusual that they are not explicitly stating how many sales happened on PC. One may be inclined to think PC sales mustn't be good if they don't want to reveal those numbers in light of the Epic Game Store controversy. However, sales can't be all that bad if this is their highest selling title on PC in a five day window. So I wonder then why the choice to not reveal the PC sales statistics? Is it part of some contractual agreement with Epic Games that they can't reveal those numbers? Is it because they don't want to reveal how many sales are on PC and make console look bad? Whatever the reason, I'm disinclined to think that it has to do with the PC sales being poor. Because they're stating it has sold better than their previous PC games and that's all that really matters. If they had sold fewer copies on PC than Borderlands 2 because they moved to the Epic Games Store, then that is something they would absolutely not want to talk about, but it sold more. But what are your thoughts? Do you feel that the Epic Games Store exclusivity has seriously hurt the sales of Borderlands 3? Sound off in the comments. On to some super fast positive RPG news. Veteran RPG studio Obsidian is now hiring for a AAA first person RPG. And remember that Obsidian was bought recently by Microsoft, so now they have that Microsoft money behind them. Among other games, Obsidian brought us Fallout New Vegas, and I look forward to seeing what they're going to deliver next. In other news, there's a new RPG in the works by some of the original the Elder Scrolls developers. Veteran devs from The Elder Scrolls came together to form Once Lost Games, and they're currently working on a massive open world RPG. On to some World of Warcraft news. A new patch has rolled out for World of Warcraft, and with it, we've got the finale for the war campaign, and a full-on CGI cinematic to go with it. Now, I'm not a World of Warcraft player, but I've always enjoyed watching the CGI cinematics. I was a Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3 player, so I could connect to some of the characters at least and have a general idea of what's going on. And there have been some WoW cinematics that I've absolutely loved. This one, however, was just okay for me. There were some nice moments interspersed with a little bit of cringe, an awkward Team Rocket blasting off again, and an ending that left me confused. But what are your thoughts on the cinematic? In other WoW news, according to the Super Data Research Company, WoW Classic tripled the game's subscriber count in August. WoW sub-revenue grew an estimated 222% in August compared to July. However, the revenue was still lower than for last year's Battle for Azeroth expansion. WoW is still holding strong, however, in the PC gaming market. On the list of the top grossing titles on PC in August 2019, World of Warcraft West ranks as number three. And West because they separate the region, so this is not including the Asian market. For comparison, League of Legends is number two, Dungeon Fighter Online is number one, Fortnite number six, Dota 2 number eight, Hearthstone West number 9. Also worthy of mentioning is that between PC console and mobile, mobile earnings made up 62% of gross revenue in August 2019. In other words, just the mobile market made about as much money as PC and console combined. A dismal glimpse at the future of gaming. In some quick Path of Exile news, the devs have deployed a performance 
hotfix. Seeking to address many of the numerous performance issues, the devs have been quick to act and they've assured us that they are continuing to work on more fixes. In Walson news, a new patch 1.2 is live. Wrath of Saracel. This is a pretty significant patch. It introduces player trading, skill cancelling or animation cancelling, which I can't wait to try out. I remember this aggravating me a bit. This should make combat feel more fluid, more responsive. They've added a nemesis system, which almost sounds like it's lifted exactly from console Diablo 3, but their nemesis system works as follows. When a character is killed in a specific game mode, the creature who made the last blow becomes stronger and all his life is regenerated. Players cannot resurrect until the nemesis has been slain. Not sure how I feel about this, but I'll reserve judgment for when I try it out. There's a bunch of other stuff in this patch, new skills, items, improvements. And one thing that got my attention is that the toughness attribute has been reworked. So it's no longer mandatory to survive, but characters using toughness will still be more resistant. I am really looking forward to trying out this change. One thing that I dislike about having attribute points in an RPG is if you're just giving us the illusion of choice, then why are we even bothering? In other words, if there's really just one main effective way of distributing your points, i.e. you have to dump a bunch into toughness or whatever its equivalent is to survive, then how is this a fun and engaging and customizable system when your option is either do the right thing or be bad? As a reminder, the devs have set a release date of January 2020 for this game. And lastly, on to Diablo news. After about a year, I've finally released part 10 in my Diablo lore series. Do be sure to check that out if you haven't or get caught up on the series as a whole if you're interested in Diablo lore at all. Lastly, in Diablo Immortal news, some folks have spotted pre-registration advertisements on their mobile devices. Now, pre-registrations have been up for this game since last BlizzCon. However, the fact that we're now seeing this pop up this isn't random. Blizzard or Activision must have taken some action to start promoting these ads. This costs money to do. Therefore, Blizzard must be spinning this up for some reason. I would not be surprised if we quietly got a either release or release date reveal around BlizzCon. And that's going to wrap up this week's video. But do be sure to have checked out last week's video in which we go over our evidence that proves that Diablo 3 is no longer in the hands of the Diablo team, but rather Blizzard's classic games team. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider pledging on YouTube or Patreon and unlocking behind-the-scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.